Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Evan Verplu. I'm the program manager here at the International Relations Council. And today we are going to be having um, a very special guest, Brian Tronick, discuss his career in human rights law as part of our International Career Series. Um, International Career Series gives an opportunity um, uh, for an individual to share their work in an international field, um, offer some insight into the educational background, career paths, all the intricacies of the field, um, as well as provide some recommendations for your own search. Um, if you're out there on the job hunt, if you're a student um, looking to, um, you know, get some idea as to as to where you might want your life to head, um, this is an opportunity to to talk with with people who have who spent time uh, in the trenches and, and doing just just really valuable, wonderful work. Um, so we encourage you uh, to bring questions today, um, sense of adventure, and uh, make full use of this opportunity. So um, we invite you to be on, on camera if you'd like during this program to make it as engaged as possible. Um, we just ask that you main, remain on mute unless you're actively asking a, a question. Um, Again, my name is Evan Verplu. I'm the, the program manager here at the IRC. Um, for those of you who might be new to the IRC, um, we're a nonpartisan, apolitical uh, nonprofit based in Kansas City. Um, our goal is to create opportunities for you to learn and discuss the about the world's most important issues and how they affect us all. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and, and pass things over to Brian. Um, again, Brian Tronick is the counsel at um, Perseus Strategies. He's a graduate of Penn Law School and holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Virginia, where he double majored in, double majored in math and philosophy. Um, after law school, he clerked for two years in the Vermont Superior Court and then moved to South India to work with a human rights organization through the William J. Clinton Fellowship for Service uh, in India. Um, he then served as the Crowley Fellow in International Human Rights um, at Fordham Law School, an assistant professor at Jindal Global Law School in India, and a supervising attorney and teaching fellow at the International Women's Human Rights Clinic at the Georgetown Law Center. Um, he's a member of the Massachusetts Bar and the District of Columbia Bar as well. So thank you so much for being here today, Brian, and uh, I'll go ahead and, and pass things off to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's just so great to be here. I'm so excited to sort of share my work with you and um and also talk about whatever it is you'd like to hear um so I'll, I'll definitely try to leave some time for questions at the end um i'm just gonna quickly share my screen so we can see and i think you can see this now so let's jump in um so i'm here to talk about international human rights law um as evan said my name is brian tronic i'm counsel at percy strategies which is a um, public interest, human rights focused law firm based here uh, in Washington, DC. So the first thing uh, I think I'll talk about is what is international law and uh, where does it come from? Um, so international law has two primary sources. Uh, the first are the international treaties and second uh, is customary law. I won't be talking about customary law very much, although I can if you, you have questions about it, but um, my focus today is on the human rights treaties. Um, to give you sort of to sum up just decades of history in, in one slide. Um, so the international human rights treaties in the modern international human rights um, sort of paradigm came after World War II um, and sort of came out of the atrocities committed by the, the Nazis. So in 1948, uh, the, uh, the United Nations newly formed um, the General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And although that was a non-binding resolution with no actual legal force, um, that sort of set forth the foundation for the many human rights treaties that came into force after it, including the ones you see listed here. Uh, that gave way to many more human rights treaties. So here's um, some, not all, of the United Nations human rights treaties. Um, you can see just briefly what sorts of issues and uh, topics they focus on. And I wanna just also highlight that in addition to the sort of UN uh, international human rights treaties, groups of states have formed regional human rights treaties. Um, so sort of in addition to international law, we have regional human rights law through sort of, uh, you know, these types of treaties, the European Convention on Human Rights and, and the others as well. 
So the one, the treaty that I uh, use most in my day-to-day -day work is the ICCPR. That's a UN treaty called the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, out of the 193 countries that are members of the UN, 173 are state uh, states parties to this treaty. And so almost every country in the world has um, voluntarily decided to join this treaty and to assume the obligations uh, provided in the treaty. Uh, I've listed there some of the basic important human rights codified in the ICCPR. And these are rights that I use all the time um, to call out states that are violating them. So you can see freedom from torture, the right to life, freedom of expression, um, freedom from arbitrary detention, which is very useful in my work on political prisoners, as well as uh, due process rights. So what do international human rights lawyers actually do? Um, we do a lot of different things, and so I couldn't possibly cover it all, but here are some key sort of broad level activities. First, when a state signs a human rights treaty and ratifies that treaty, they've assumed obligations. So we push states, and of course by states I mean countries, to fulfill their obligations under international law. And when they don't fulfill those obligations, hold them accountable in various ways, some of which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the third thing listed here is we work to strengthen the international human rights system. A common complaint about international human rights law is that it lacks teeth. That is, it doesn't have meaningful or strong enforcement mechanisms. Um, there are some enforcement mechanisms, but we always wanna work to get stronger and better ones. And finally, um, we try to develop new international standards for areas of human rights law that actually may not have existed until recently due to technological advances. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit as well. So at Perseus Strategies, where I serve as counsel, we have a couple different practice areas listed here. Um, I'm gonna focus today on the international human rights practice area. And so I've listed some of our um, sort of sub areas within the international human rights uh, practice area. Uh, our bread and butter that we do a ton of is political prisoner work, representing political prisoners throughout the world. And I'll give you specific examples of cases just in a minute. We also do international torts. I'll talk about that. Um, and then some international parental child abduction cases. And we do some uh, responsibility to protect work, which I'll, I'll also talk about. Um, and then we have thematic work uh, and some other areas that I, I don't think I'll have time to get into today. So how do we go about our work in you know, promoting and fighting for human rights? Well, um, there's a lot of different ways, but I've listed some here. So um, perhaps the most basic that I'm sure all of you have seen uh, people do are documenting human rights violations, gathering evidence, and naming and shaming the perpetrators. Um, but we also do legal advocacy, uh, political advocacy. So getting the US government or other governments involved in pressuring a foreign government to do something to protect human rights. Um, we sort of work with incentives, conditions on foreign aid, uh, sanctions, so targeted sanctions against specific people. I'm not talking about sanctions against a whole country. I'm talking about sanctions against a specific person in a foreign country who is known to be a human rights abuser. And then the last one is really maybe the most important is whatever works. Um, you know, human rights advocacy um, requires a certain amount of creativity and doing whatever you think will help your clients. And so um, we will do whatever will work in a given case, really. So I think the most interesting way to spend our time together is to talk about my actual cases. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Iskander Yerimbatov. Um, he is a Kazakh national. Um, and he's a very, he was and uh, is a very successful businessman. Um, so he owned a, a number of businesses, was an investor, and he was not political. And I say that because a lot of political prisoners are targeted because they're doing political work, right? They're speaking out, they're running for office and stuff like that. He was not doing that. He's a businessman. Um, but his sister uh, was a very prominent human rights lawyer in Kazakhstan who had worked directly with the leading opposition figure in Kazakhstan. Um, due to the persecution she faced, she actually had to flee the country and seek asylum in another country. Um, but his connection to his sister is what made him actually a target. So what happened to him? Uh, in November 2017, he was arrested for alleged money laundering and held in pretrial detention. So he's in prison. Um, throughout his time in detention, he experienced numerous due process violations. That is, numerous violations of his due process rights under the ICCPR, the treaty I mentioned. 
And I'm listing just a couple here. First, he's arrested without a warrant. Um, when you're arrested under international law, you have to be informed of the reason for your arrest and um, um, also told of the basis for your arrest. What is the conduct you're accused of? But he was just arrested without a warrant with no information whatsoever. He was repeatedly interrogated without a lawyer present, but international law, like many national laws, um, you have a right to have a lawyer present when you're interrogated by the authorities. His lawyer was not given full or prompt access to his case file, which makes it very hard to prepare a defense in court when you don't even know the full basis of the charges against him. Um, he was not allowed to attend his own review hearings of his pretrial detention. That is, every one or two months, the court would hold a review hearing to decide should we keep him in pretrial detention longer? Well, he has the right as the accused to attend those hearings, but um, they decided not to bring him to those. And they would just decide to keep him without his, uh, the chance for him to give any argument. Um, he had restricted access to his lawyer and family throughout. Um, his family would try to visit him, they would be denied. His lawyer would try to visit him. The lawyers would be denied, although sometimes they'd be let through. And also there was an arbitrary denial of bail. As you may know, um, when someone is charged with a crime, there's a presumption of bail in international law as well as many countries' laws. That is, um, a person who is accused of a crime is presumed innocent and therefore should not be detained um, until trial, unless there are specific reasons to think they will flee and not attend the trial or maybe commit another crime. So courts, in order to hold someone in detention pretrial, are required under international law to make a specific finding that their detention pretrial is necessary for specific reasons. The courts never did that. They just held them pretrial um, basically for no reason, just because they wanted to. Uh, as is common in many of our cases, he was tortured. Uh, I won't go into details, but suffice it to say it was brutal and cruel. Um, and then he was denied medical treatment for the injuries he sustained um, during that treatment. Um, finally, I want to note that this was clearly a politically motivated prosecution. And we know this because during the interrogations, uh, Iskander was told by the interrogators if he could convince his sister, who again, uh, used to be a very prominent human rights lawyer in Kazakhstan before she fled, uh, if, she, if he could convince his sister to come back to Kazakhstan and incriminate that opposition leader uh, she used to work with, then they would not prosecute him at all. So they offered him that. He said no, but um, that just shows the political motivation. It wasn't about him. It was about getting his sister back to Kazakhstan to incriminate a, a leading opposition figure. So what happened? Um, so he was arrested in November 2017. In March 2018, the authorities, I think, realized they couldn't actually make money laundering stick. So they switched. We said, we're no longer going to look at money laundering. We're not going to bring you to trial on that. We're going to accuse you of something completely different, fraud, OK? Um, the fraud allegations were facially absurd. Um, so what was the fraud that he was accused of? So basically, he was a businessman. And as a businessman, he would make bids for contracts. And then either his bid would be rejected or accepted, right? Um, and that's how bidding works in the world of business. Um, in one bid in particular, he made and he won and other bids were rejected because his was the most cost effective, whatever the reason. That very bid that he won, um, the government later said was too high. But again, in a competitive, competitive bidding process, there's no such thing as a bid that's too high as a, as a crime. If it's too high, the person reviewing the bid simply rejects it and chooses a better one. Um, so he's essentially accused of just participating in normal business activities, bidding on a contract, and he won that contract, no less. Never mind that it didn't make any sense. Um, he was convicted of fraud in October 2018, given a seven-year prison sentence. So what did we do? I want to give you a sense of our work. Legal. So first, we filed a complaint, a legal complaint, a petition, to a, uh, the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. Uh, this is a body at the United Nations that has the mandate to review cases of detention anywhere in the world and um, give an opinion, a legal opinion, whether that detention complies with international law or does not. And so this is the petition we, um, we submitted on Iskander's behalf. The government gets to reply and then we get to reply to the government's reply. So it's a little bit of a um, sort of a, a you know, complaint reply reply process. And then um, when, thankfully, when the working group issued its opinion in November of 2018, um, we won, right? So the UN is now saying that our client's detention 
violates the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And importantly, the UN is now calling for uh, Kazakhstan to release our client immediately. Now, having this uh, document, this written opinion from the UN saying our client is detained unlawfully under international law is incredibly powerful because we can use that to get other people to advocate for our client. Um, politicians by their nature are conservative uh, people uh, and uh, very few politicians would stick their neck out for our client based on my word alone, because I'm his lawyer and they don't know me. And so um, it's hard to trust me alone. But when I have an opinion from the United Nations saying my client should be released, then I can get politicians on board. And that's exactly what we did. We took that um, decision by the UN and we got 17 US senators, which is no small feat because there's only hundred US senators. We got 17 of the sitting US senators, well, back then anyway, in 2019, to write a letter directly to the president of Kazakhstan demanding our client's release. And um, we know for a fact that this terrified Kazakhstan because getting 17 US senators to do anything is very difficult. And the fact that they all wrote the president directly terrified Kazakhstan. Um, and um, the ambassador, the, the Kazakh ambassador to the US started um, sort of reaching out to these senators saying, no, 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 you have it all wrong. But of course we have the UN opinion. So he couldn't get very far. And then we did public relations strategy. So here's an op-ed that our firm's managing director published in The Diplomat. You can see him, uh, Jared Genser, the firm's director, managing director there, pictured in Kazakhstan at the trial. And behind him is our client, Iskander Yurembatov, at his own trial. Um, Iskander is held there, but you can see behind a glass pane. Um, that's actually a violation of international law itself because everyone has the right to the presumption of innocence. And that means if you're charged with a crime, you should not be held in conditions that indicate you are guilty. And holding someone in a cage like that indicates they're guilty. And so um, that itself was a violation of international law. So this is an example of an op-ed we placed to raise uh, awareness and outrage about our client's case. And thankfully, uh, not long after, December 2019, he was released. Um, this is a tweet by his sister, Bocha. Um, and this is the sister I told you, who was the human rights lawyer in Kazakhstan who had to flee the country because she was persecuted. So she's tweeting here in December about Iskander's release. Note what she says there. He was not released because he was innocent or the charges were absurd. Kazakhstan would never do that because it means they have to admit they're wrong. They released him on medical furlough, which means we're not admitting he was innocent. What we're admitting is he has serious health problems and we're gonna let him out for that reason. So Kazakhstan gets to look like the good guy here, even though the real reason they're um, releasing him is because the charges were baseless and he was a political prisoner. Um, so he got out. I wanna tell you about another client of uh, ours, um, Peter B.R. Uh, Ajak from South Sudan. Um, he is truly one of the most remarkable humans I have ever met. Um, he was one of Sudan's lost boys. You may have heard that term, the lost boys. Uh, that refers to a group of youth who fled on foot the Su second Sudanese civil war. So he basically walked to Kenya, grew up in a refugee camp in Kenya before being re uh, resettled to the United States as a refugee when he was 16. Once here, he began to excel academically. He's one of the smartest people I also know. He went to LaSalle University and then to Harvard for his master's. But listen to this, instead of staying in the United States and living a good life here as, as an activist and, and, and scholar, he went back to South Sudan when the country obtained its independence. You may know that South Sudan is the newest country in the world. So when South Sudan got its independence, he moved back there to uh, advocate for his new country and try to help it develop and grow and find peace. He worked there for the government itself and for the World Bank. And he also became a leading scholar and peace activist. And he worked with the youth of South Sudan to find peace because there's still throughout, there's been incredible violence there, uh, ethnic and um, communal violence. Um, of a particular relevance to my talk is that he started criticizing the current leaders of South Sudan who are all very corrupt and bad people. You can Google them and see why, but suffice it to say, they're all interested in becoming rich and staying in power and have done little to actually end the violence in South Sudan. And he criticized them relentlessly, including on, the, on TV programs and news programs. So what happened to him? In July, 2018, he was arrested at Juba Airport um, by the NSS. The NSS is the National Security Service, the intelligence service of the uh, uh, South Sudan. They are infamous 
for disappearing, detaining, torturing, and killing anyone perceived to oppose the government. Uh, again, Google the NSS in South Sudan, you'll see plenty uh, on them. He was detained at the Blue House, um, referring to the NSS headquarters in Juba. Um, it's painted blue. Um, the NSS headquarters is known as South Sudan's most feared prison, and for good reason. You can imagine what goes on there. Uh, people languish for years, people are tortured, and some are even murdered uh, extrajudicially. Um, basically, so when he was arrested, he was not charged with any crime at all. So he's, he's in jail, sitting in jail, no, no, no criminal charges, which is a violation of international law. But he's being investigated for some very serious charges um, that could lead to the death penalty, treason and terrorism, which is laughable given who this guy is. Um, so basically, we learned through sources that these, the treason and terrorism investigation related to his work with the youth of South Sudan. So again, he's going out into the villages of South Sudan. He's going to Nairobi to work with South Sudanese youth there. And he's teaching them about peace and peace activism, intercommunal peace. And for this, he's uh, accused and investigated for terrorism and treason. Um, he's not charged with a crime uh, then. In October 2018, what does happen in prison, in the Blue House, there was a prison protest where some of the prisoners were able to get access to the guards' guns. So the prisoners took up arms um, and, and basically um, took over the prison. Peter, of course, being a peace activist, did not. Uh, in fact, he is one, he's, he's the one who helped negotiate an end to the protest and got the prisoners to lay down their weapons. But during the protest, he did a phone interview with the Voice of America. So the Voice of America wanted to speak with someone inside the prison to hear what was going on. And he, he's, he's smart, he's educated, so he agreed to take the call. He talks to Voice of America about why they were protesting, which was many of them didn't get food or water, or clean food or good, you know, all that. And that many of them, the prisoners there, were languishing for literally years with a no criminal charge. So they're protesting for basic rights. And he shares this with Voice of America. For doing that phone interview, he's charged, criminally charged with disturbing the peace. So note again, there's no charge of treason or terrorism because that was always bogus. The only thing they can come up with, let's charge him with disturbing the peace because he gave a phone interview with Voice of America during a prison protest. Of course, giving an interview is protected under the right to freedom of expression, but nonetheless, they charge him and he was convicted and sentenced to two years in prison in June. Um, so here's some of the stuff we did for him. Um, Again, legal work. We, um, we uh, filed an urgent appeal to two uh, UN special rapporteurs. That's a fancy name for experts. So two UN experts. Uh, the first was a special rapporteur on human rights defenders. And the second was a special rapporteur on freedom of expression. And the reason that we wrote to those two is because he was targeted for his work as a human rights defender, and he was targeted for his work um, speaking out using his right to freedom of expression. We wrote to them asking them to intervene um, uh, and protect his rights. Uh, again, we, wrote, we filed a petition as we did in the last case to the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention, asking them, we need, a, we need a written opinion finding our client is held in violation of international law. We did political advocacy. Pictured here is um, the floor of the US Congress, the House of Representatives. This is Congresswoman Madeline Dean um, speaking about Peter. That's a photo of him, uh, Peter she brought to the floor of the US House of Representatives. And she gave a floor speech uh, about Peter and why he was innocent and why he should be released. Um, um, let's see, I, I see there's a question I will try to get, I'm gonna save questions at the end, but thank you, I, I, I'm excited to answer them. Um, here's another uh, statement on the Senate floor, Senator Patrick Leahy, one of the eldest Senate, uh, well, you know, sort of senior uh, senators in the US Senate, gave a floor statement on our client as well in the US Senate. Um, public relations, we did again, a media blitz and tweets and uh, op-eds. This is, I think, the, this is the BBC writing a, um, an article about his uh, detention. Um, and so what happened to Peter, right? So we did all this. In January 2020, the president of South Sudan pardoned and released him. Again, notice that they didn't admit that they had imprisoned him unlawfully. They just pardoned him so they can look like the good guy, right? Um, but nonetheless, he was released. We thought that was the end of the case. We thought Peter is free. He went back to Nairobi to be with his wife and kids. Um, we thought that was the end of the case. Not so. 
uh, in June 2020, we got a call from Peter. Uh, he was in hiding in Nairobi with his family uh, because he had learned from he had learned from a very high level um, official that South Sudan had sent a hit squad to get him in Nairobi. And I want to emphasize this is not an idle threat. The United Nations has concluded South Sudan has sent a hit squad after other people in the past, and um, and including um, at least two other men who were abducted and murdered by South Sudan from Nairobi. So this is not an idle threat. This is something they have done in the past. So what did we do? Well, we initially freaked out, but we worked um, furiously behind the scenes to get him, uh, him and his family members emergency visas to the United States so he could uh, escape the threat. We are confident that South Sudan would not do such a bold move to uh, in the United States. So we worked behind the scenes with the State Department to get him emergency visas. Um, and we were able to do so. And in July 2020, he and his family arrived safely in the US. Um, personally, it was very meaningful in that I was there when he and his family arrived at Dulles Airport in, in, in the Washington DC, or near, it's actually in Virginia. Um, and, um, and so Peter and his family arrived. You can see me and my colleagues in the background. And he has been here and safe since, uh, continuing his, his, his work. Um, um, I am going to just briefly talk about some of our other clients. I'm not gonna go into all the stuff we've done just in the interest of time, but I'll give you a sense of who we work with. Um, this is Bakr and Siamak Namazi. They're American citizens who have been held hostage in Iran for about four, uh, five and six years respectively. Um, they're a father and son. Bakr on the left is the father. Simak is the son. Um, they were both convicted in October 2016 of ridiculous charges, um, specifically collaborating with a hostile foreign government, meaning the United States. They are accused of basically spying for the United States on Iran, which is absurd. Bakr, the father, is a he worked for UNICEF. That's the UN Children's Fund uh, for years, helping children throughout the world. And Simak is a scholar and a businessman, um, and, and the fact that, you know, the, the suggestion that either are spies in any way is, is, is ridiculous, but they remain detained in Iran to this day. Um, actually, Bakr is, is not in prison. He is uh, basically held at his home, but he's not allowed to leave the country despite his uh, serious medical problems. So they remain uh, detained essentially in Iran. This is our, our current client, Sultana Kaya. Uh, she's an activist who's been under house arrest without criminal charge since November of last year. She is a um, Sarawi, uh, excuse me, um, a Sarawi activist, meaning she advocates for the independence of the Sarawi people. Um, they live in the Western Sahara, which is a legally it's part of Morocco, but the UN has recognized that Western Sahara um, is entitled to decide on uh, their own self determination, meaning they should be given the the chance to secede from Morocco and, and create their own country if they so choose. Morocco, of course, has refused to allow this to happen. Um, so anyway, like many uh, activists who call for independence for Western Sahara, she's been brutally uh, beaten, uh, repressed, and she is still under house arrest nearly a year later um, today. Uh, this is um, Felix Maradiaga and Juan Sebastian Chamorro from Nicaragua. They were presidential candidates um, seeking election in this year's November presidential election in Nicaragua. Uh, however, President Ortega has no uh, desire. You may have been following what's going on there. President Ortega will not, uh, simply refuses to face credible and fair elections. In the past few months alone, he has detained or disappeared seven different presidential candidates, including these two men. Um, these men were arrested in June and they were disappeared for nearly three months, meaning uh, no one knew where they were. Even their own family didn't know where they were and did not in fact know if they were even alive. Thankfully, um, in September, they surfaced. They were still detained, but they were alive and they had a brief family visit. They're charged with undermining national integrity and conspiracy, whatever that means. Um, so they remain detained and I believe they're now currently held incommunicado, which means no access to outside world, including their families. Um, these are their wives, Berta and Vicky, pictured here in this tweet. Um, we worked closely with Berta and Vicky to advocate for their uh, husband's release. We brought uh, Berta and Vicky to DC for a week just recently for a week of meetings with US government officials and other people. And what's crazy is that literally days after the meetings with US government officials, Nicaragua 
uh, convicted them in absentia of being traitors to the country. So they come here to the DC to DC for meetings with US government officials. They're convicted in absentia of being traitors to the homeland. Now they can no longer go back to Nicaragua. Um, to give you a sense of our non-political prisoner work, this is April Corley. Um, she, on the left, you can see, she was a professional world-class athlete and roller skater. Um, she was um, participated in national championships and world championships. She had been uh, a choreographer for Katy Perry and some of her music videos or tours, I'm sorry. She had performed with Madonna multiple times. So she was truly um, a world-class roller skater and athlete. Sadly, in November, 2015, she was in Egypt um, traveling with her boyfriend. Um, they were on a tour group sightseeing in the desert. And in the early afternoon, they stopped for lunch. And while they were having their lunch, the Egyptian military um, sent helicopters after them, shot missiles and 30 millimeter rounds at them from the helicopters, killing 12 people, including her boyfriend. Um, April survived, but sustained life-threatening and life-altering injuries from which she's yet to recover fully. Um, so you can see her on the right in, uh, sorry, in um, the hospital soon after the attack. Um, she, um, again, she is alive, but she, her injuries are so severe even today, six years later, that she, um, her doctors have said she will never recover fully from her injuries and she will always need life, she'll need lifelong medical and psychiatric care, physical therapy and pain management. And she has forever lost her career as an athlete. So Egypt admits, it is admitted publicly that attack on the tour group was a mistake. They said, oops, we shouldn't have done that. These are not bad people. We thought they might be terrorists. We were wrong, it was a tour group. They admit publicly it was a mistake, but they will not, and they have not for six years, uh, offered April any meaningful, um, reasonable compensation to take care of her injuries and sustain her for the rest of her life. Um, again, she needs lifelong medical care, psychiatric care, she needs service providers who can help her do daily tasks like cooking. She can't even brush her own hair because she has um, an injury to her back that's so severe she can't lift up her arm all the way to brush her own hair. And of course, she lost income for the rest of her life. So, um, so, so the first question is, why can't she sue Egypt for money damages? That's what we do as lawyers, right? Um, when someone is injured, we, we sue the, the, wrong, the wrongful party for money damages, right? Well... Um, due to something called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, uh, a U.S. citizen, no one here, can sue a foreign government in a U.S. court. Uh, they have sovereign immunity. There are a few exceptions to that, but none apply to Egypt. So she has no court or judicial remedy um, to get money from Egypt. So, uh, so what can she do? She can hire us to do sort of political advocacy and a few other things I don't have time to talk about. But I wanna point out, it's especially galling and insulting that Egypt won't offer her reasonable compensation because every single year, Egypt gets over $1 billion from the US in military aid, and that's military aid. So the April's own tax dollars helped purchase the very helicopter used to um, nearly kill her. Um, two more things I wanna talk about about what we do at uh, Percy Strategies. The responsibility to protect our uh, firm's managing director, pictured here, Jared Genser, is the special advisor on the responsibility to protect for the OAS, the Organization for American States. R2P, as it's called, is a doctrine that came out of the failures of the international community to prevent the genocides in Rwanda and Srebrenica in the 1990s. So due to the those utter failures and uh, other failures to stop the genocide, uh, the international community came together and developed this doctrine that says, if, if a country is utterly failing to protect its own people uh, um, against mass atrocity crimes like genocide or crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, the other countries have a legal obligation, not a moral one, well, also moral, but legal obligation under international law to go stop the uh, mass atrocities. Now, of course, that does include the use of force but only as a last resort. There are dozens of other actions that should be tried as appropriate before actually using force. Um, and there are other things that countries can do, um, sending human rights monitors, political advocacy, stuff like that. Uh, so we support Jared uh, in his mandate with the OAS on the R2P. Um, and his mandate is to essentially develop a regional R2P system with the OAS 
to help better respond to mass atrocity crimes and not just respond, prevent, right? How can mass atrocity crimes be prevented before they actually occur? And, the, and finally, the other thing I wanna mention about what we do is, um, is we, as I mentioned, human rights lawyers work to establish standards for cutting edge areas of human rights that's uh, issues that didn't exist uh, until recently. One of these that we are working on are um, so-called neuro rights. Um, we set up uh, with others, the Neuro Rights Foundation, which is focused on developing international standards based on human rights for the use and development of neurotechnology. Neurotechnology, um, you may be shocked about what actually today exists in neurotechnology. We already have the ability to read someone's mind um, uh, using uh, a helmet and read their thoughts and translate those to specific words. That already exists today. Again, it's not that it can um, interpret every thought, but the technology has already exist to, to maybe translate 60 to 100 words um, just from a person's brain function. Um, and then the, the, the other side is, is, is writing thoughts into someone's brain, um, either thought or emotion implantation. And this technology, again, exists in some form today. And so um, there are no international uh, standards that exist. There's a patchwork in different areas that exist, but no one has come and tied them all together in one uh, uh, standard on neurotechnology. So that's what we're working to do with one of the world's leading scholars and doctors on neurotechnology who's based out of Columbia University. He's been working in this area for decades and we're uh, helping him develop those standards. You can see more about this work at the website uh, at the bottom. And so finally, I've been asked to talk about my career path. How did I end up doing what I do? Um, I'm gonna just really go quickly here, but um, uh, sorry, I should start by saying this slide is very misleading because it's a straight line. Uh, my career path, as you'll see, has been anything but a straight line. And I wanna emphasize that that's okay. Um, and that it's okay if you ha don't have your whole career mapped out in front of you for the next 10 or 20 years. Um, you know, I think sometimes it just, you have to figure out your way as you go and that is perfectly okay. And, and you still get where you need to be. I started out as a high school math teacher. Then I joined the Peace Corps and for two years lived in a very remote village in Kenya and taught math and physics at a high school there. Uh, then I went to law school. Um, then I was for two years a law clerk at the Superior Court of Vermont. Um, then I did a bunch of fellowships. Uh, I did one through the American India Foundation where I worked at a human rights organization in India for 10 months. Then I moved to New York and did a clinical teaching fellowship at Fordham Law School. Uh, I created a project on access to justice by the LGBT community in Bangladesh. And then I, I, I created a course on that. And I then took my students to Bangladesh for two weeks where we worked with local partners on uh, research into that um, issue. Then I moved back to India and taught human rights classes in India at a law school. Um, one study we did was focused on police um, treatment or mistreatment of the transgender community in Delhi, but we did a bunch of other human rights projects as well. I moved to DC after that um, and did a clinical teaching fellowship at Georgetown Law School, teaching um, the International Women's Human Rights Clinic, uh, basically working with uh, women's rights lawyers in African countries and helping them uh, fight discrimination against women in those countries, including legal discrimination uh, laws that discriminate against women in those countries. And then finally, after that, I joined Perseus Strategies, um, which is the law firm where I work today. And I've been here for about three three years and change. Um, so I wanna end there. Um, I put our, the website of Perseus Strategies there if you wanna see more about what we do and my emails there. Um, I feel free to you know, reach out to me and ask me any questions that I don't get to today. Um, but I'm happy to take questions and Evan, let me know if you wanna, uh, you have questions or should I take some in the chat? I'm, I'm happy to do whatever's best. Yeah, I you know I really want to prioritize what um, the folks on the program uh, want to want to hear about. So if you wanted to start with the uh, the questions in the chat, and then I can I can jump in if we uh, get through those. Absolutely, and there's some great questions, y'all. Thank you for asking. Um, are human rights advocates helpful um, because powerful states can simply choose to ignore international law? So great question. Um, and again, it ties back to something I said about international human rights law lacking teeth, right? Um, and it can be hard uh, to enforce human rights law uh, against powerful countries, there's no question. But that said, I, I think you might be surprised at what you can do and what is possible. 
Um, so um, in Europe, for example, the European Court of Human Rights is sort of the gold standard in international human rights bodies. It, it has enforcement mechanisms that others do not have. Um, and that's just due to the way the European court was set up. And so um, there are ways to, to sort of in, um, enforce things as is, and, and I agree it's, it's weak in many cases. And so in, in those cases, you have to rely on political advocacy, naming and shaming can be uh, powerful. Um, but that ties back to something I said is we, we need to do better. We need to improve accountability mechanisms, including against countries like the United States, right? We know the US is a human rights violator in many ways, and we have to improve um, you know, this country's accountability under international law as well. So I, I guess I want to agree with you actually, because human rights law needs better enforcement mechanisms. Although that said, there's a lot you can do with what exists today. Um, and, and you know what, you have to do your best with what exists and then hopefully I can leave the system better than when I found it in, in a few decades. Um, how do we arrive at justice um, to, as, as it's difficult to arrive to get accountability? Um, can accountability be achieved or will the bad guys always end up looking good? Uh, it's a fair question. I mean, I'll say this, we've been remarkably effective at getting our clients freed, right? Um, and so, um, you know, our, uh, Peter Ajak was freed. He's now in the United States. Our Kazakhstan client was freed. And I have many examples of past clients I could give where we freed the political prisoners. And I, I guess maybe what you're asking is, you know, they release them in such a way that they look good. Oh, we're granting a pardon. We're giving them medical furlough. Um, I want to say that I think everyone sees through that. And we, of course, make sure everyone sees through that, right? Like, so when, they, when our client is released in a way that the government's trying to look good, I mean, we shout from the rooftops, we tell the State Department, the White House, you know, uh, members of Congress, um, diplomats, NGO, everyone knows essentially that the way they released was a sham and it's just to provide them cover. So, I mean, um, I'm not sure they end up looking good. I think everyone realizes they look ridiculous. They just they don't want to come out and the country does not want to come out and say explicitly this was a sham they, they want cover or they want to save face but everyone knows they're doing that and so i'm not sure they actually come out looking good i think people recognize what they're doing um, um and let me say this it can be difficult to get accountability our clients in iran right they've been detained for five and six years and we've worked uh for much of that time um I think that's because there, there's a small handful of countries and Iran is one and I would put like Russia, Saudi Arabia, maybe a few others, China that are particularly immune to, um, to advocacy campaigns. And part of that is because they don't, they, they simply don't care how much they're criticized or what you try to do. But most countries like 90 plus percent of countries care what the United States thinks of them and what European countries think of them and what other countries in their region think of them. And so there is a lot of pressure that can be brought on most countries in the world, but Iran in particular is one of the sort of um, most obstinate and most difficult to deal with, um, unfortunately. Although we still have reason for hope in that case, actually. Um, I could talk more about that case, but um, due to time, I'll, I'll move on. Um, can international law be used to help the Uyghur Muslims? I mean, uh, that is, you know, this is one of the, I, the, the, there are many serious human rights, you know, abuses uh, that are just terrible and at a scale that is hard to comprehend. And this is one of the worst, I think, in the world. Um, the answer is yes, uh, but again, it's, it's very difficult. And, and it comes to my point in that um, uh, human rights law, in some cases, it falls short. And, and, and in particular, again, China is one of those countries that is, is extremely difficult to move with, with human rights advocacy. Um, China, Iran, and, and you know, a few others. Um, so, um, so the answer is yes. And I wanna point out especially um, that first method of advocacy I mentioned, um, naming and shaming and documenting human rights violations. So China it has done a, a, a remarkable job, at least initially in like preventing information from getting out about these, you know, detention camps and what they're actually doing. Uh, thankfully, we've had some great reporting um, uh, on sort of actually what's going on. 
in, in you know, with the Uyghur uh, detention camps and stuff like that. So that first function, naming and shaming and documenting the problem is hugely important. And you really can't do much until that's, you know, that happens. And it's friend, thankfully it's now happening, but, um, but um, I share your frustration and um, there are people trying to do stuff with this, um, but it's incredibly, it's incredibly frustrating and hard. Um, sorry, is a career in uh, human rights international law financially rewarding? Pro uh, this is a great question. Um, so uh, it's a great question and it, it depends, right? Um, so I'm a lawyer, I went to Penn Law School. Most of my friends and colleagues from Penn Law School, after law school, right out of law school, went to New York or DC, worked for large law firms and right out of law school are making like $180,000 a year, 160, 180, right? Um, that's a lot of money. Um, um, I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and so I pursued a different path and I was, I was very conscious of the financial repercussions. And so you have to know going in that you're not gonna make the same salary, for example, as a corporate lawyer. And that's just a choice you, you, you need to be, you know, you have to make up front. Um, that said, there are ways to get paid in human rights work. And I'm, I'm an example of that, um, where you can, you can make a living and you can make a comfortable living. Um, but again, you have to know, you could be doing other things where you'd be making a lot more money. Um, so that's something to think about for sure. The safety of human rights activists, is it guaranteed? No in many cases. Um, in the United States, right, I feel fairly safe. Um, uh, I, you know, I don't think my life is in danger day to day, but we work with people who have been, who have um, foreign governments have tried to kill several times. That's, I don't think it's ever happened in the United States. Um, so we, uh, um, but we've worked with people who have been poisoned by um, foreign governments. And like I said, Peter, um, our client from South Sudan, uh, had a hit squad sent after him in Nairobi. But again, I, I, I think and I hope South Sudan wouldn't try that here. Um, but that, that is to say, um, no, he, throughout the world, human rights activists are detained and, and frankly tortured and killed all the time. I have the privilege to sit here in the United States and do much of this work, although we travel abroad for, for our work as well. But so we work with people whose safety is definitely not guaranteed. And we try to support them and protect them and one of the ways we protect people like Peter and other others is bringing international attention to, to their cases. Um, so if a repressive government can detain and torture and maybe kill someone that no one has ever heard of, right? That's easy. But once they have the United States asking about this person uh, or the White House even, once you have the United Nations asking about this person, um, that uh, sometimes at least will give some measure of protection to that person. Um, and we've seen that in, the, in our cases, um, actually, we've seen that sort of pressure um, work. I, we, in one of our cases in particular, they were torturing our client brutally, I might add. Uh, we had a high level, very, very high level government official in the United States raise that torture directly with his counterpart in that foreign country. The next day, the torture stopped, next day. He was still detained unlawfully. He was still a political prisoner, but what a giant win for our client to at least be able to be detained and not be tortured. So, um, so you know, we do what we can to protect our clients, but honestly, it's, it's really tough. A lot, there's a lot of people doing very um, brave and impressive work under terrible conditions. Um, hi, Orna, I, I know you uh, well, and it's good to see you. Um, do politicians from the US act on international human rights when it affects their constituents, when it affects the votes? Yes, they do. Um, so um, basically, I'm sorry, they do in some cases. So some of our human rights cases involve US citizens who are detained abroad. And it's very easy to get their Congress members and their senators and, and their representatives involved because they're their constituents. So definitely one, some of the first people we go to when uh, someone, at least someone, a US citizen is detained abroad are their, their representative and senators, representative and senators. Um, and some, and, and some uh, members of Congress are just interested either in a region or on an issue. So some senators and some representatives are actually care very much. And I say this on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, um, some are very passionate about human rights work. And some have a very specific interest in a country like Russia 
or Iran or Venezuela, and we can get them interested in our cases there because they're interested, not necessarily in human rights, though they may be, but they're interested in that country and they care what happens in that country. And then we get them involved that way. So yes, we work closely with Sen the Senate and we work closely with the House of Representatives and we work closely with uh, the White House on some cases, because again, the White House has foreign policy goals and we, we, we sometimes our clients fit into those. Um, moving on. Uh, oh, someone's joining. Hi, Priscilla from Nigeria. Thank you for coming all the way from Nigeria. Um, I appreciate you listening in. Um, um, yeah, uh, Priscilla, just email me. My email is there. We do take interns all the time, including virtual. In fact, all of our interns have been virtual for the past year and a half or so. So um, hi, Priscilla, we do take virtual interns. Um, we accept like an application, we have a process. So just um, why don't you reach out to me in my email and I'd be happy to talk to you about that in more detail. Um, uh, Chad, I fully agree with you. Um, um, you know, human rights law is not perfect. And I'm the, I, you know, I am a critic in some ways of human rights law because of what it can't do in many cases. You know, I, like I said, I have clients who are in jail today and um, we've not been able to get out yet, although we've made progress in certain other ways, right? Um, and the frustration is good. I'm glad you're frustrated because that frustration can be motivating to do stuff and improve the system, right? And, and I also wanna emphasize, you, you have to be tenacious. So some of our clients were not released within a year, but two or three years. Um, and, I, and, and that's horrible because every day spent in prison unlawfully is a tragedy, a tragedy for them and their family. But getting someone out after two years when they had a 20 year prison sentence is still in some way a victory because they can live their life and be with their family. So um, sometimes you have to accept partial wins, right? Partial wins, maybe it's stopping the torture or maybe someone's held incommunicado and we can get them access to family and to a lawyer. Or maybe um, if they're very sick, we can actually not get them sort of released but we can get them released into home, their home into medical furlough. So they can live at home while they're detained and, and sort of get the medical treatment they need. So sometimes the best we can do, at least in the short term is, is a partial win, but we always go for the full win and we always, we never give up. We'll never give up on our clients. Um, and so um, anyway, I just wanna echo your uh, frustration, Chad. But again, I think we as activists, we take that frustration and we work with it and we, we work to improve the system. You know, we say, no, this is not okay. We have to make a better system. We have to have more accountability. And, um, and that's, the, that's what we do. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, hi, oh, uh, hi, uh, hi, Rishav. I'm sorry, if, I hope I'm saying that right, from India. Um, uh, it's so, oh, you, internship, yeah. Um, Rishav, just uh, my email's up there, uh, get in touch. We've actually had people, um, we've had Indian students work with us before. Um, so, um, I, um, so just uh, reach out and we'll, let's talk more about it. Um, you know, we, we love taking on interns and working with people and we love working, you know, with people across the world and, and globe, um, you know, and the human rights has no border, right? I mean, um, again, there's people, oh, I see Orna, a, a friend. How are you? So good to see you. Say hello. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. It's been so nice listening to you. It's so good to see. I know Orna. She's, she, I'm speaking of young, you know, um, I love being in touch with young human rights activists and she's one. You should hear about what she's done already as such a young person. She is a, a I'm inspired by the work she's, she's done. And um, Orna, one of these days we need to get you on for an internship. At, you know, I know you have a job, so not now, but down the road maybe. Um, um, but yes, uh, Orna is doing some great work now at her job, and she has back in Bangladesh. And again, it's it's you. Like I'm, a, you know, I'm. I think I'm older than most of you. I'm I'm 43. You guys are the future of human rights. And so uh, it's not me. I, I'm sort of you know mid career here. Um, I, I love working with the young people. You guys are the ones who are going to carry it forward, really, truly, truly. Um, and so, you know, be in touch with me. Uh, 28, still young in my book, um, Chad. So, um, but yeah, I, I encourage all of you to keep your interest in international work. And I want to say to all of you, there's lots of ways to do human rights work. You don't have to be a human rights lawyer. Um, there's lots, lots of um, ways to be involved. Um, you know, there's ways to do, I, you know, if you want to talk about this, like we can talk another time, happy to, happy to talk about it, but you don't need to go to law school. You can, it's a great way to do this work, but it's not the only way. Um, um, so 
just keep keep your interests. Um, and sorry, and uh, I think uh, Rishav, yes, that's my email, btronic at Perseus hyphen. Don't forget the hyphen, strategies.com. Uh, email me and I'll get back to you uh, hopefully pretty quickly. I will get back to you, maybe not same day or anything, but I promise to get back to you. All right, well, we just have a few minutes left. Does anyone have any, any final questions um, here before, before we wrap up? Um, feel free to type them in the chat or if you'd like to, to come on uh, camera and mic and, and ask, ask one of Brian, um, uh, that would be wonderful. Well, and, and I'll, I'll say one more thing is that, um, and um, I'll say that this speaker series is wonderful because um, if you wanna do sort of international human rights work, it's, it's really good to have international experience. And that includes like teaching English abroad, that whatever, it's really important to do sort of the work I do is to have, and of course, many of you have lived abroad and that's just, that's great, are from abroad. But for those who are like lived in the United States, it's great to get that experience through any form of employment abroad. Um, and Evan, of course, this, this series is, is helping people do exactly that. So I encourage you all. So I was in the Peace Corps. I wasn't doing human rights. I was teaching math, but that really set the stage for my career in what I'm doing now, living abroad, seeing the issues that people face abroad. Um, so I encourage you to, you know, even if you don't want to do um, you know, necessarily law school to, to go pursue whatever international work you want to do, just will open your mind and, and connect you with people and things. Wonderful. All right. Well, I think we will we'll go ahead and uh, and call it a day unless anybody uh, uh, has any any final thoughts or, or questions. Brian, thank you so much for, for taking the time today to, to discuss your career, um, you know, some current issues as it relates to, to human rights law and, um, you know, all the guidance that you've provided. It's, it's extremely valuable. And um, I'm, I'm so glad uh, that everyone was able to, to take some time here out of your day to, to join the program. It, it was very valuable. And um, so thank you so much, everyone. It, it means a lot. Um, thank you, Evan, thank you for the thank you, Orna. Thank you, Evan, for the invites. And um, again, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to talk about careers and international work or whatever it is. Um, so uh, thank you all for listening. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, uh, and we hope you'll join next week. Um, we're going to be joined by uh, Karen Britt, who is a um, a professor at Northwest um, Missouri State uh, here in, in uh, just, just north of, of Kansas City. She's gonna be discussing her career in uh, archeology span um, and some of the, the work that she's done um, in the art field as well. So that should be another great uh, international career series. If you'd like to learn more about that register, you can head to our website, um, www.irckc.org. And we certainly hope to see you on a, on a program in the future. Um, we were recording today. So if um, you'd like to come back and, re and review this program, it should be posted to our, our YouTube page, probably uh, Monday or Tuesday of next week. So. Um, invite you to head to that. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone, and we will hope to see you soon. Thank you, guys. Bye.